case recognition and case definition in the multi-country outbreak. I have no disclosures to report. So talking about the global picture, this slide is definitely going to be out of date by the time you see this. But currently today, there are 53,000 cases, 18 deaths uh, in 125 countries, majority of which are in the region of the Americas, following, followed by Europe. And in terms of the key features, looking at the WHO data set, which is N equals 27,000, 98% of people are male, 95% of people are gay and bisexual men who have sex with men, of whom 1.7% are bisexual. The median age is 36, uh, and 1.8%, sorry, not 108, but 1.8% are female. And the most commonly reported setting is the party setting with sexual contact. Children are representing 0.6% of this data set, people with HIV, 45%. And very small numbers of healthcare workers have been reported, only 313. And importantly, uh, these are still being ass assessed as to whether they are occupational uh, or otherwise. So I think that's an important uh, background uh, to set. Overall, the numbers uh, this past week have been declining globally, but there is a growing fraction of people with no MSM contact who are a developing monkeypox. So what I'm going to focus on today is the evolution of the case definitions during the multi-country outbreak. So in May 2022, what happened is that it became very apparent very quickly that a particular sexual network was being affected. And this is the, uh, the sexually active men who have sex with men, uh, gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. It's important to say sexually active. It's not all men who have sex with men. But the case definitions expanded very quickly to include particular vigilance uh, in this community. Uh, and in terms of clinical symptoms and signs, what you can see here is the original descriptions at that time in May. And they were referring to an unexplained acute rash in most cases. The CDC description was more specific around the type of the lesions and the evolution of lesions. Um, and you can see that fever, lymphadenopathy, and other sort of non-specific prodromal features were also mentioned across all of the different guidelines. So these were pretty much a summary of the key features of the guidelines. And you can see there are many, many similarities focusing on lymph nodes, prodrome, and an unexplained acute rash and fever. Importantly, mucosal symptoms were not mentioned at all in any of the guidelines. Now, what I'm going to talk about is four key case series um, that occurred early uh, in the multi-country outbreak. So um, this paper was the paper that I was the uh, global uh, lead for this paper, the senior lead author. And um, this is a paper which covered monkeypox virus infection across 16 countries, uh, which were diagnosed uh, between April and June. And you can see that there were 43 sites uh, in 16 countries and many, many collaborators, hundreds of clinicians uh, co collaborated uh, to, to contribute data and people cont contributed their data to the case series. Um, the other case series which I'm going to cover were this very first case series, which came from uh, the Chelsea and Westminster Group for West London Clinics uh, very early on. Uh, and then uh, following the NHM case series came the BMJ case series from a single South London clinic. And you can see both of those originated in London. And then uh, this case series came out of Spain, out of Madrid uh, and Barcelona, which is a, another a very large case series, uh, which came slightly afterwards and reported some very interesting findings. So looking across at the demographics of these four case series, you can see that this is a predominantly male cohort. There were a couple of uh, female uh, patients in the Spanish cohort, but none in the other in the other case series. These were predominantly MSM uh, men who have sex with men uh, around 38. Uh, and you can see that there were large proportions of people uh, living with HIV, 41% in our cohort and 40% in the Spanish cohort. And you can see predominantly the people with HIV being undetectable and very well. Interestingly, there were some people in both the global series and the Spanish series who had been vaccinated for smallpox. 
sexually trans sexually uh, se suspected sexual transmission is the overwhelming uh, mode of uh, suspected transmission. And people tend to have a lot of partners, around five partners in the last month, and many people had more than that. Travel history was commonly reported, as was sex on site venues, uh, and known sexual contact with monkeypox were pretty common. Some people were using recreational drugs, and you can see that the reports of household contacts were very, very low. Uh, and large proportions of people uh, reported uh, STIs. In the global case series, it was 30%. So a very important consideration is where did the people attend? Because the health setting of initial presentation uh, for the global case series included sexual health clinics, HIV clinics, emergency departments, dermatology clinics, primary care, and private clinics. And this is such an important point to stress because it means that this infection is not only going to be seen by specialists, ID physicians, HIV physicians, sexual health physicians who really know about monkeypox, but it's going to present to clinicians that don't know about monkeypox and really may not be expecting it, which means that the case definitions that are provided so that when someone thinks, could this be monkeypox, and they read the descriptions, it's really explicit and they can work out that it's monkeypox. These case series also managed to pin down the, the, the incubation period to seven days, uh, which is a sort of kind of specific to this particular global outbreak. Uh, in the global case series, 95% of people presented with rash and 73% of them were anogenital rash, affecting uh, also the trunk, arms and limbs and also the palms and soles in 10%. Interestingly, 64% had less than 10 lesions and 54, which is more than 10%, had a single genital lesion. And the rash was very wide ranging, wide spectrum of appearance, macular, pustular, vesicular and crusted and lesions in multiple phases were reported. But the most commonly described presentation was vesicular pustular. So when we look at the other case descriptors, what we see from the other case series is very similar findings, multiple stages being reported. And in terms of number of lesions, lots of the case series reporting small numbers of lesions. And as we've heard, this is very different to what we would expect uh, in the animal associated monkeypox. So single lesion presentations occurring in, in 10 and 11%. And we can see also some, some presentations in the face, body, uh, hands and feet. So this is a, uh, this is a descriptive chronological case. And you can see that the sexual contact was day minus four at the bottom. Day zero, it started with that big single genital lesion. And by four to six, the person had started to feel unwell uh, and developed in additional lesions. You can see that they were misdiagnosed at day zero. Uh, and monkeypox confirmed at day 11, by which time there were other lesions on the face. And you can see that the PCR positivity continued out to day 21 uh, for these lesions. So just to show you how things evolved from a single lesion moving on to systemic symptoms thereafter. And this is the appearance of how the penile and scrotal lesions can look. And you can see quite a wide and varied uh, appearance for these lesions from small numbers to larger numbers and through the different stages of evolution. Importantly, uh, our case series demonstrated that 41% of people had mucosal lesions and the anorectal mucosa was reported as the presenting symptom in 61% of people. So actually pure rectal presentations. And then oral pharyngeal symptoms were reported as the initial symptom in 26 people and in three people conjunctival mucosa. Now, other groups reported penile edema and urethritis and paraphimosis as presenting findings. So you can see that mucosal lesions were frequently reported. The Spanish group reported them in 35%. And you can see oral lesions as first symptom, as I've said, in 5% of our group and anal lesions as first symptom in 12%. But they are commonly reported. Uh, and this is a very important finding.
So if we look at the noteworthy oral lesions, if I were to show these lesions to you, what you can see is that in some cases it's very explicit. You see the umbilicated features of the rashes you would expect uh, around the skin and around the mouth. But you can see on the top panel, there's a single perioral lesion over there, which would be very easy to misdiagnose. And you can see the tongue lesions are quite specific, these sort of circular looking lesions, but they can look different in the sort of more fungating uh, image, which actually was PCR positive positive at the bottom, tonsillar presentations are common. And in the Spanish paper, which I, 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 I could mention here, what was found, which was very fascinating, is they actually associated uh, the type of sex to where the lesions occurred. So what they noticed is then people who had insertive anal sex were likely to get anal lesions, and people who had oral sex were likely to get tonsillar lesions. So they really were able to, to, to associate uh, the theory of the inoculum that we and others uh, suggested that there may be a, a site of inoculum as, as, as happens in smallpox. So if we look at the notable anorectal presentations, what I, um, this, this panel was actually included in the main paper. And what we show you here are the small anal uh, ulcers that you can see. And you can see uh, this is uh, inside the, anum, you can, the anus. You can see some proctitis uh, in the second image. And you can see really friable mucosa in the third image. In the fourth image, you can see something that could easily be misdiagnosed for herpes. And in the fifth image, you can see um, small little lesions and, and a single seminal lesion uh, on, uh, alongside it. Um, but in the final panel on the right, what you see is a, is a very small macule. And that really could be misdiagnosed with anything. And I find that image quite terrifying as it was really the only, uh, only lesion for quite a long time in this particular person. And you can see the potential for misdiagnosis is very high. And that's why we need to think about it. We also now know that based on two groups, a group in France and a group in Antwerp, they've managed to show asymptomatic uh, carriage of monkeypox virus DNA based on uh, asymptomatic people who were, who were screened retrospectively. So we do need to be aware of this as a possibility. We can see that systemic symptoms were common, particularly fever. We can see headache, uh, possibly less common with myalgia, lymphadenopathy, arthralgia, fatigue occurring. And we also asked about low mood, which occurred in 10% of people. Now, there were a number of reasons for admission and complication. Um, so I think what I want to say here is that it was a range of uh, sort of percentages for admission. So in our global case series, we saw uh, that 11% were admitted for medical reasons, and this was 9% in the West London cohort, 10% in the South London cohort, which is very consistent, and then much, much smaller in the Spanish cohort, and I'm not really sure why that was. So we can see that the reasons for admission, many of them were related to infections, um, but rectal complications were a huge driver of these admissions. If you look at the third line, huge driver. And you can see that complications of the oral lesions were also very, very important. And we can see that penile swelling was an important factor. Now, other documented complications in the multi-country outbreak were epiglottitis, myocarditis in two cases in the case series, and acute kidney in injury, which was associated with dehydration and tonsillar lesions. In the West London cohort, it was related to cellulitis and disseminated infection. The South London cohort was mainly related to urinary retention and paraphimosis, but they also admitted people due to conjunctival lesions, and one person had rectal perforation. And there were multiple disseminated lesions. And I am receiving emails from clinicians around the world mentioning that they have experienced rectal perforation as well. Um, and you can see on the on, on the right, the exanthem was also an issue that's been described. Very few people have been treated and we reported no deaths. So uh, this lesion is a, a nasal lesion. And you can see here that this was reported um, in this particular person who had very long term PCR positivity and this very unsightly and painful nasal lesion. Um, and I think in terms of bodily presentations, you can see that you can get small umbilicated lesions, but we did also see uh, lesions on the fingers, which looked like whitlows, as you might expect with herpes. And we did also report the exanthem, the morbilliform rash uh, that's been reported by other groups, as well as uh, sort of lesions of the soul. 41% of people uh, 
were living with HIV in our cohort. The median CD4 count was 680. And you can see that 97% uh, of people were undetectable on treatment. And we saw no differences in natural history or outcomes observed across the entire cohort. And we reviewed the site of presentation, nature, site, and, and type of extent of rash, and we didn't see any differences. However, what I would say is of the three most significant complications, which were epiglottitis and myocarditis, two of these occurred in people with HIV. And interestingly, um, the CDC have reported on uh, outcomes in HIV, uh, which is coming out today. Uh, it will be out by the time you hear this presentation. And they have actually shown some differences in people with HIV versus people without HIV. But the group were not quite as well controlled as our group. And also um, there, were dis there were disparities related to uh, diversity uh, and ethnicity, which are important. In our cohort, we did find 29 of people who had semen tested uh, had monkeypox DNA in the semen, which is important. And I'd like to end on a note of activism. I always try to do this, um, but it's really been interesting to me to watch how activism has evolved because uh, many of the people who've been involved in the response, both patients uh, and clinicians are very active HIV physicians. But we now have a new generation of monkeypox act, uh, activists. And here we see Haroon Tulane who documented his entire patient journey on Twitter. He also had nasal lesions like the one I showed you. Uh, and he has shared his experience and for his trouble in trying to, to help other people, he's been flooded with homophobic abuse, but he has risen from this challenge and he is giving podcasts and continue to help people uh, with monkeypox. Um, I have been involved in activism to change the case definitions. Because as you saw, the case definitions didn't include single lesions or mucosal lesions. And I've, I've been involved in press conferences at AIDS 2022 and also at challenging uh, WHO and CDC on the stage around the inclusion of the definitions uh, of mucosal and single lesions. And I'm happy to say that I had the wonderful opportunity of working with the WHO on the case definitions, and I'll show them to you soon. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the CDC definitions took longer, um, and I did write to Dr. Walensky immediately after the case series was published, um, and it's taken quite some time uh, for this uh, to be included after quite significant activism. And I think it's important to mention that this activism because none of us is too small or too insignificant to try and deliver change whether you're a patient or a clinician. And I think that because of how I've shown you how important it is that patients are presenting to surgeons, they're presenting to urologists, they're presenting to gynecologists, they're presenting to GPs, it's absolutely vital that the case definitions are extremely explicit and explain to everyone involved um, where, uh, where you should look and what the lesions look like. And you can see that the WHO has now included a very extensive definition of the lesions and the CDC has now included uh, oral lesions as well as rectal symptoms and the ECDC is currently updating its guideline. So on that note, I'm going to uh, end my talk and I look very much forward uh, to, to the question session uh, to discussing uh, new data, no doubt, that will have come out uh, between uh, now and, and next week. And I hope that you found this helpful. <laughs>